Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning. Like I said, I'm excited about all the things that are happening today. I'm excited. I, I know uh, for those of you who looked outside and thinking, oh man, we're going to have an outside event today. The sun's supposed to come out about the right time, and it's going to be a beautiful day. So I'm excited for that and excited for the ministry that's going to take place this afternoon. We're continuing on with our series entitled Prodigal, and I want to refresh our memory as to what that's all about, because when you see that title, maybe we've forgotten that there are a couple of definitions for the idea of prodigal, prodigal, what that means is, and one of them is this idea of this pouring out, this lavishing upon someone else, this giving generously to another person pouring out in an extravagant way on somebody's life. And so that's what we're talking about today when we're referring to that, when we're thinking about that. That's how we're defining that definition of prodigal. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, that's where we'll begin this morning. Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 35. Begins with a question that's asked by Peter, and it comes with some background Um, Because this is a question that was asked, and we'll kind of go into that later. And this begins with the question that Peter asked. He says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle in the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. The fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Somewhere, possibly on more than one computer server, is a record of everything that you owe. If you did a credit report, those people were able to tap in and look at everything you owe and line it all up and see who you owe what to. And for some of us, we be th- we're thinking right now of the things we owe. The, the, it pops into our head automatically. Sorry about that. I didn't want to give you that kind of an image of the things that you owe. But it's a reality for everybody. Mortgages, car loans, student loans, credit cards, medical bills, all of these things, we know what we owe. We know the things that we owe, the things that we have to pay. Down to the penny, this somewhere else, somebody else is calculating this, tabulating this, and keeping track, and compounding interest. Okay, People are keeping track of all these things. But can you imagine for a minute coming home from work or coming back to your house and going to the mail, because nobody likes to go to the mail because nobody sends letters anymore. It's always bills and junk. So, But you have to open it. So you open the mailbox, and you pull it out, and there's a letter from one of the places that you owe. And you're dreading opening it because you don't want to see your balance. You don't want to see what's owed. But you slice it open, pull out the letter, and plug your nose and prepare to read. And you find out. It says... Dear Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, we've been reviewing your account, and it is your lucky day. This is your lucky day. Your account has been settled. We've settled it. It's all forgiven. It's paid in full. All your debt that you have with us is wiped clean. Have a great week. I'm still looking for my letter like this. I don't know. (laughs) I I mean, I have no other thing but hope when I look in the mailbox. I figured maybe that could be the day. But wouldn't it be amazing if we got 
a letter like this and we had been forgiven of our debt, can you imagine the relief you'd feel? You'd celebrate. You'd be posting happy, happy Facebook posts and you'd be sending texts to all your friends saying, you're not going to believe what just happened. Maybe you'd even go out for supper because you feel like, I can afford to go out for supper because this debt has been resolved. And you're excited about that. You would be so happy. There'd be no more sleepless nights. There'd be no more pinching pennies. There'd be nothing hanging over your head. You're forgiven. In Matthew chapter 18, 21 through 35, we're privy to a conversation between Peter and Jesus dealing with this whole idea of forgiveness. Now, it's not a monetary matter that, G that we're talking about here, but Jesus uses that as an example to teach us a lesson on, a for on forgiveness in a spiritual sense. And we learn from this passage that as followers of Jesus, we must forgive other people. And from the passage, we find three truths that will help us as we learn what it means and learn how to forgive other people. And the first lesson is found in verses 21 and 22, and that is we have to learn that forgiveness is a way of life. Forgiveness is a way of life. Verses 21 and 22 of Matthew 18. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. In verse 21, Peter poses a question about how many times I should forgive my brother. And when we read that, for us here in the 21st century, it seems like kind of a weird question. Why would you ask that? Why would you pose that question? Why would that even cross your mind, really, about how often should I forgive people? We take for granted that, oh, we should forgive people, and that's the right thing to do. But looking from a Jewish perspective, there was a law that was in place, and the law said, and they were taught, and there was a debate amongst the rabbis how many times that they should forgive people. And the common belief at that time, from everything that I've read, was they said, we should forgive people three times. You forgive people three times, which is interesting. It's kind of like three strikes in baseball, three strikes you're out, but you give them, forgive them three times. And on the fourth time, you're good to go. You don't have to forgive them anymore. You can write them off, and they can receive the punishment that is due for whatever infraction it is that they have caused, in keeping with that letter of the law. Peter, by choosing the number seven, is actually showing some generosity. And I'm not sure why he did that, why he chose the number seven. Just trying to add a little bit more to it. Or, you know, this is just a common number that's used in scripture, the number seven. So maybe this is why he uses that number. We're not exactly sure. But Jesus' response, we're very clear of, and we see what he has to say. Jesus responds with 77 times. And this wasn't meant to be a number to be kept track of, but rather communicating that we must be willing to forgive one another indefinitely. We must be willing to forgive one another each and every day for everything. It's a way of our life. When you're a kid, at least when I was a kid, I thought that the 77 deal, I thought that was great because I'm thinking to myself, I had... I had some people that, that used to bug me, and I, th I thought to myself, one time I was trying to count up in my head how many times I'd forgiven those people, and I thought, surely I'm into the hundreds by now. <clears throat> so that should be good. Until I actually learned what this actually meant and what Jesus was actually getting at. And I'm sure a lot of people might look at it that way too, thinking, I've forgiven these people enough. But Jesus is saying this has to become a way of life. We're not responsible for keeping a score against other people. It's not our responsibility to keep score and tally for what other people have done. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter 4, 8. This is what Peter has to say. Peter says this. He says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. So each of us... When we look at that scripture, we have to think about that. We're thinking about our forgiveness in terms of how we love other people. Do we love other people? Are we showing that love to others? Or are we keeping score? Each of us has a responsibility to love and forgive as our first response. 
We don't keep track of how many people, times people have sinned against us or what our brothers have done to us and begin to harbor bitterness towards them. We just forgive them. We just forgive them because that's our way of life. That's what we're called to do. We forgive other people as our response. Do we look at people and view them? And this is the question. Do we look at people and view them based upon what they've done to us or the choices that they've made? Or are we quick to forgive people and view people in a different way? Do we look at people through the lens of their past failures? How do we do this? God's desire is for all people that sin to be restored and in right relationship with him. We can show our forgiveness to individuals. There are ways, how do we know if we've forgiven somebody? What are some things that we can do? How do we know? What are some practical ways that we can work on forgiving other people? Because it's not easy. It's not always as easy as saying, yeah, I forgive you. One of the ways that we can do this is by praying for people. Do we pray for people? The Bible tells us to love our enemies and pray for those. When we're trying to work on forgiving people, they must be in our prayers, in our heart. Are we praying for those people, praying about what's going on in their life, praying about the choices that we're making, praying that if they're continuing to sin, that they're in, become back to a right relationship with God. Part of our forgiveness requires us to pray for those people and keep them on our hearts and lift them up before God. And this is a hard thing to do. This is a hard thing to do from personal experience. It's a hard challenge. I know when I've dealt with these kind of things in my life, I've been reminded by the person that lives in my house that's asked me, have you prayed for these people? If you're having a problem, have you prayed for them? And usually my response is I kind of look at the ground and shuffle my feet and go, no, I don't want to. don't want to pray for those people. But I know that that's what's required of me. If I'm going to offer forgiveness, it needs to start there. I need to begin to pray for people. Pray for those that have either wronged me or are doing things they shouldn't do. It's awkward and it's difficult at first, but that's something that we need to do. Another way that we can demonstrate our forgiveness is by encouraging people. Sometimes we can encourage them. If they're going down the wrong road, we continue to encourage them, either by a note or face to face. Can we encourage people and try and and show that we love them and we care about them. Even if we disagree, we can encourage those people. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to care about people enough to forgive them and encourage them? Another way that we can do that is in some situations, we can include them in what we are doing. We can come alongside of them. And if we see their lives going the direction it shouldn't go, maybe we can go alongside of them and bring them into what we're doing and encourage them by being a friend to them. Can we do this? Can we show them that we forgive them and we want to help them be successful in their walk with Christ? And we're going to help them any way that we can and support them any way possible. We can't keep score and we can't keep tally of all the things that people have done, for us, done to us. We have to be willing to forgive for sports fans, this time of year has reached the pinnacle of sports. If you're a sports person, this is it. This short window of a couple of weeks, this is kind of a big deal because there's football on. A lot of people like that, college and professional. People like that. They didn't really like it last night. If you like Nebraska, it was a sad day. Iowa, you won because you didn't play, but that was good for you guys. The NBA has just started. And people like basketball, they think that's pretty cool. Hockey season has started, and that's awesome because who doesn't like hockey, right? That's a fun sport. And of course, who could forget the World Series? So you have all of these things going on for this brief window simultaneously, and it's an exciting time. And it's become second nature. If you're a sports person, if you're into this, you kind of keep track. And you hear in the hallways here at church, you hear it where you work or when you're around people at the store, people talking about the score. What was this score? What was that score? Who won here? Who won there? What were, how many receiving yards this person have? How did this all work out? And we keep track of all these facts like there's something that's really super important. And it becomes an important thing. Life 
has become a sport to us. It's like that. We treat a lot of ways, a lot of things in life like a sport. Nike even has a slogan that said, life is a sport. They've used that. But the difference between life and sports, the difference between life that we live every day and what's going on on fields all around the country is that unlike sports, in life we don't keep score. We don't keep track of all these things. And Jesus is telling us in this passage that if we're going to love like he did, forgiveness has to be our way of life. Not keeping track of ways people have sinned against us. That's what he's called us to do. There's a second lesson that we learn from this passage in Matthew 18. And that is, we must remember how the Lord has forgave us. Let's pick up at verse 23 through 27. And Jesus answered, I tell you, or not seven times, but 77 times. That was verse 22. Sorry about that. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the master order that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. In this passage, Jesus is using an illustration of a king and a servant to make his point. The idea that he is communicating to us is that we have been forgiven. And we have not been forgiven just a little bit. We've been forgiven an astronomical amount. And I was trying to figure out exactly what the amount was that Jesus is using here when he talks about uh, that amount, the 10,000 talents. And there's, been a, there's a lot of discussion about how much that is and the best thing I could come up with is the fact it's a lot of money it's it's an astronomical amount that can never really be repaid nobody seems to be in agreement upon what that is but it's an astronomical amount of money that was owed and that's the point that Jesus is making here is what we owe our debt to God is an astronomical thing it's a large amount that we can never repay the rulers at that time, they took outstanding debt very seriously. This wasn't a game for them. They didn't play around with people owing people money. If you didn't pay your debts, if you didn't pay what you owed, you would be locked up, punished, everything that you had sold, and it was bad news for you. There was no grace. There wasn't forgiveness. This was what it was. This was the law. You followed the law. People took it seriously. This was an important thing. But the servant pleaded his case in a, a state of desperation. He begs the king and tells him he'll pay back everything he owes, which as we know as we're sitting here, that's a lie because there's no way he can pay back everything he owes. That's the point. He couldn't pay that back, but he's begging. But in an unexpected show of mercy, the king forgives his debt. The king forgives him. We don't know why he does that. It doesn't say but the king is forgiven the debt that is owed to him. When we think about our lives and think about who we are, we serve a king that has, in fact, forgiven our debts. Turn me to Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Romans 4, 25. Paul writes this, talking about Jesus. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. We look at that and we see that Jesus was given over for what we'd done. He paid the price that we couldn't pay. He paid the price for our sins on the cross. And that has given us the forgiveness that we couldn't earn on our own. When we look at our lives, an honest evaluation will show that we've been forgiven much more than anything we could ever imagine. And we need to continue to forgive others. And we are continually being forgiven in our lives. As we look at other people, it should bring us pause for reflections. We think about our own lives and how we've been extended grace by our Heavenly Father. It should cause us to think about this and think about what God has done for us. If we're going to be grace givers, we must live lives of gratitude for the grace and forgiveness God has given us. 
when we're thinking about this, does it cross our mind very often about what God has done for us? Do we make it ever a matter of prayer? Do, when we spend time with God, do we thank him for his mercy that he gives us daily to us? Do we thank God for the mercy that he shows us? That's one thing that we can do. As we look at scripture, do we see the examples of how Jesus is forgiven to us? Do we remember those scriptures and hide them in our heart and think about them and meditate on them as we deal with others so that they're there to recall when we think about what Christ has done for us as we are dealing with other people throughout our day. Jesus has set us an example of how we're to love and forgive other people. And this is something that we have to remember and we have to pass on to others. We have to remember where we came from, remember where we were, and remember what was given to us. Remember what was lavished upon us by God, this forgiveness to each of us. There's a phrase that's often used when talking about people that have risen out of low situations and have risen to something great, risen to something big. And <laughs> that phrase is, remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. We always admire an athlete or an entrepreneur that remembers where they came from. Oftentimes we see these little vignettes that people do, these short stories, these little videos of people that have come from humble circumstances and they go back to where they came from. And maybe you see them at the barber shop or at the store talking to people. You see them at a school making donations, helping people, setting up a foundation for their area um, to help people that are in need. They remember where they came from. And they remember that they've ex received much and been blessed much and are giving back. When we think about our relationship with Jesus, we have to remember where we came from. Remember the grace that has been given to us, the forgiveness that's been shown to us. And be mindful of this as we offer forgiveness for other people. We have to think about this as we give back to other people and show that grace and mercy. There's a third lesson that we learn, and that is we must view forgiveness from a kingdom perspective. Verses 28 through 35. Matthew, verses 28 through 35. But when the fellow servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that happened. When the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I cancel all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have shown, had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how the heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. Jesus is teaching here that our forgiveness of others relates to how God forgives us. It's a kingdom thing. This is an important thing. Our relationship with God and his kingdom rests on this, how we forgive other people. We're called to model his example. Ephesians 4.32. Paul writes, make, <laughs> Ephesians 4.32 Lost my thought. There it is. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. How we treat others impacts their walk with Christ, it impacts their walk in God's kingdom, and impacts our walk in God's kingdom. How do we how we forgive others? It makes a difference. It matters. We're going to be asked to give an accounting for how we have treated other people that belong to God's kingdom. We're going to have to give an account for how we have forgiven other people, how we have looked upon them. We're not only, we have to remember, we're not only representing ourselves here with how we treat others and offer forgiveness, but we're representing God's kingdom. How we act, how we conduct ourselves, we have to remember that we're representing not only us, but God. This is a difficult thing. When we think about this, how do we represent God? Is our attitude 
towards others the same as Jesus? Do we treat people with that kind of love and forgiveness? Do the words that we say in person, what we type online, what we send to people in text messages, do they represent who we say we believe? This is a difficult thing. Does our treatment of others reflect poorly on the God that we serve? We have to ask ourselves this question. How do we forgive? How do we forgive other people? It's a kingdom issue. Are we prepared to answer for the actions and receive the kingdom consequences for our lives? Are we prepared to answer for the things we've done and give an accounting for what's taken place during our time here on this earth? We have an expectation that we're to follow God and we're to forgive and love as he did. Many organizations, many teams, etc., have contracts or covenants for how they act. People sign up, they know what they are. There are certain expectations for those that are a part of a group or part of a business. And if those expectations aren't met, they have to give an accounting. And we frequently hear things from businesses or athletics. We've heard a lot of this at college level, that they're suspended or dismissed because of violation of team rules. Now, we don't always know what they did. We don't always know what caused the issue. But everyone knows that if they belong to this group, this business, this organization, when they belong to that, there are some things that they need to do in a way they need to live and a way they need to conduct themselves. We who belong to God's kingdom have to understand the expectations that we have been given, that have been put forth for us in Scripture. And we have to understand that we're going to have to give an answer or an accounting for the things that we've done, for how we live, how we conduct ourselves. We're going to have to give a response for this. As followers of Jesus, we must forgive others. We have to understand, and this has to become a way of life. We have to remember that we too have been forgiven. We must look at this from a kingdom perspective as we seek to follow Jesus in all that we do. We've come to a point in our service where it's time for a decision. We're thinking about Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. Maybe someone here hasn't made that decision to make Jesus Christ accept him as their Lord and Savior. We invite you to come for that. We also invite you to come if you'd just like to be prayed with, um, maybe as you relate to people. We would love to pray with you and encourage you and cheer you on as you seek to follow God in all that you do. Would you stand as we close in song?